Well, thank you very much. I know that I'm the last presenter of the day. We usually have the hardest time to get attention. Uh, but this is a real situation that I'm the last one to speak today because we had Estefan talking about multiple dispatch, and Miles talking about jump, and now Alejandro gave all the introduction to the energy systems problem. So I can actually just tell you how we're using jump uh, to solve the problem that we're interested in. Um, the first thing to mention, let me see this up here. Is uh, so this what I'm presenting today, and I'm sorry because the it seems that the resolution of the screen is not allowing to see all the details at the end. Um, but basically, what we're presenting today is part of a larger project called SIP, which is called uh, Sustainable Integrated uh, Infrastructure Planning, and it's, ba it's made uh, made out of two packages. So our approach to understanding power system integrations and renewable integration stories is that we can separate issues related with data an issue related with the formulation and the functional assumptions of the model. So we have developed two packages to handle these two pieces. PowerSystems.jl, which is a package that contains uh, a structs with power system components that we can do multiple dispatch on, and we can actually deploy different constraints and formulations based on the type of device we're modeling. And we have PowerSimulations.jl, where we can actually leverage these structs to, actually, to construct different optimization problems and different formulations depending on the type of analysis you want to make. So the first thing that I want to show is um, what is the framework that we basically work on. So we start with this idea that there is a meta model for any power system optimization problem that is based on an objective function, some constraints that represent the devices, some constraints that represent uh, network <laughs> problems, and some constraints that represent the services. These constraints are subject to parameters, to decision variables, and some kind of uncertainty if available in this way. So based on this structure, I'm going to describe how it's implemented in software uh, this model. And the idea is that we are able to do something that we call multiple points of entry. So basically, if you're a researcher wor working on mathematical programming, complexifying uh, constraints, and trying to do <laughs> you know, different types of modeling, you can actually integrate your contributions into an optimization problem. If you are an, ana an analyst that wants to understand how renewable integration works, given different, different scenarios, different devices, what happens if you integrate storage or you have more or less flexibility, you can also use the same. And if you want to study a the full uh, operation of a market and you want to run many uh, systems in tandem, you can also do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you like the, yeah. The so, so we have decision variables, state variables, control variables, parameters, and uncertainty. Okay. Yeah. So that's basically how we think about it, right? And again, we, we separate the types of constraints functionally by devices, network, and services. Um, so for this example, I'm going to use a FIBO system, although the objective of this uh, package is actually to scale up to very large systems. So a lot of the things I'm going to show right now for a five-ball system might look like an overkill, but the design itself is made to actually solve really large problems. So the first thing is like we've created this package power system, which I'm going to just going to talk briefly, that uses in a single stroke, and we have to improve our printing. Uh, basically, all the details about a power system, which are the buses, the generators, the different types of branches, the types of storage, and, the, and all of this is stored in a, in a Julia struct. And we, sorry? So buses, a bus is basically the node where things are connected to. So we have devices that are actually physical devices and topological devices. So bus is, in this case, a topological device. A device. We have different types of generation that we can support it. And we can actually, for example, define the buses. And the nice thing about defining these devices in terms of structs is that then we can call a device that depends on other structs internally. So for example, a branch, instead of having the classical power system matrix style that says, you know, two modes are connected between one and two, and then you need to go and figure out somewhere what it's one and two, we can actually say what are the explicit buses that the line is connected between. And we can actually, in each generator, we can know all the details of the bus that that generator is connected to without having to overload the memory of the data, data structure. So the, design, the first design principle for our packages is that we want flexibility. And basically, the idea is that we can specify different device model formulations depending on the type of analysis that we want. And in here, there's a particular thing that we're also interested in, is the fact that we have reproducible models. 
So if I go today and I write a paper and I propose a formulation for the unicorn women problem, that any researcher can actually go and understand both the software and the mathematical parts of my of my uh, I mean, of my you know approach. And the idea is that we can actually create optimization problems combining by a, a tuple of two information, the type of device and the formulation of the device. So we dispatch a Julia function based on device type and device formulation, and that creates the constraints that we need. And uh, well, other thing is that we basically ca can use, can reuse code. So we go back to the code reuse and wrapping around different jump functions that to have common uh, types of constraints we find in power systems. So this is an example of a tree structure for formulation that we have. So here we have on the higher, on the most abstract way, we have an abstract thermal generator formulation. So this is the most complicated formulation you can imagine, which for our case at this time is basically the AC unit commitment version of a thermal generator. And then depending on which formulation do we dispatch on thermal generation data, we can create different types of constraints. So what we have is a device specification that can have a different type of model. And that calls a set of common constraints that we find in power system uh, problems. For example, range, uh, range subject to time series data, uh, semi-continuous ranges, rate of change, duration, and then we can populate those constraints with the specific parameters. And this is a quick example. So for example, thermal generators. This function right here, we have a dispatch on abstract thermal formulation, which is the, the, the largest, the most abstract point in the tree. So let me go back here. And this is up here, right? This is this piece. You know, so the most complex formulation. And in this formulation, because for us it's the uh, AC, the AC version of unit commitment, we basically deploy a set of device semi-continuous range parameters. So the active power constraints are semi-continuous. And inside of this function, device semi-continuous, what we have is the jump code. Uh, sorry, but I'm going to show the jump code later on. And in here, we have a more specialized type of, of model, which is just thermal dispatch, which is just a thermal generator without the unit commitment. And coming back to the tree, that is basically a more specialized version down here, here and all its variants. So for these variants of formulations, what we can dispatch on, what we do is that we use just range constraints, no semi-continuous. And inside of these functions that create constraints and you, that where you find the jump code, basically what we do is just pass on the data in a generic way, the name of the constraint we want to create, and the name of the variables that are going to be involved in that constraint creation. So in this way, we can actually track down how every one of the, of the equations is formulated. So in this case, one of the key features that we use in jump is that we pre-generate a lot of these containers. So we use con jump containers heavily in our code to be able to pre-allocate where these constraints are going to be and generate them in the most efficient code, in the most efficient way. Uh, and this is how it looks like. So if you have an economic dispatch problem, you can go to your devices and see your thermal generators. And this is going to tell you that your device model is a thermal generator type from power system. So it's a device type thermal generator. And it will use the formulation thermal dispatch. So in thermal dispatch, Basically, what we have is that this generator in time step one basically is in a range <laughs> based on the data. And in here, we can see all the constraints for a very simple economic dispatch problem that has a copper plate balance network specification and thermal active ranges, because it's only an active power problem. Now, if we have a unit commitment, then we can see that our device model now is for thermal generators, but we've changed the formulation. We've changed the formulation to a unit commitment, which is, uh, so it creates a semi-continuous range, right? So basically, uh, given that there's no bridge right now in jump to define semi-continuous and then split it up, we define it as two constraints. But basically, we have this common functionality that deploys this type of constraints generally found. And in a unique commitment problem, we have a more complex, and this is a unique commitment without network. So we have all the extra constraints that are generally, so that is the most general case that includes thermal ranges, that in thermal ramping, that includes times, that includes time ups, time downs, and so on. So we can actually generalize and dispatch over the most general description and then specialize down. <laughs> and the nice thing about this is like one of the important questions in power system research today is which models can be considered relaxations of a larger model and which model are approximations that are not necessarily come down from relaxation. So a lot of people doing research in power system optimization 
they want to find out how can I formulate either relaxation that gives me some properties on the results versus an approximation that gives me other properties. So by doing this, what we're trying to do is create a framework that would allow us to eventually expand these trees of types, identifying clearly when are you basically plugging into a relaxation and when are you plugging into a, an approximation. And finally, like how can, how can we mix and change device formulations? So in my economic dispatch model now, but the first one that I showed now, let's say I'm interested in understanding what happens to the system if I lose flexibility. Like now my generators are ramp constraint. So I can change the formulation here, change my device model and a device formulation, rebuild my economic dispatch problem. And now I've created uh, ramping constraints into the same model with the same data. So all my assumptions about other devices or my network or anything else hasn't changed and I just updated my thermal generation uh, formulation. So now the network representation has been a really interesting collaboration. I think that talking to what Stefan was uh, mentioning on code reuse, this has been one of a really interesting success story. So some of you here are familiar with power models. It's a Los Alamos package for understanding AC relaxations and power flow. Uh, so in a collaboration with Los Alamos, it was actually surprisingly easy to take all of the work that we've put together, understanding devices, and just basically plug into their network models. So we can integrate with power models very quickly to, to uh, abstract from them not only their code, but also their type structure. So using their type structure, we can extend that type structure, include some of uh, formulations of networks that they're not particularly priority for them right now. So we can have theirs and we can have ours. And, and not everything works kind of very seamlessly, right? Um, and this allows us to expand the scope of the type of research that we do, not only to formulate problems, but also to test and to compare with other formulations quite easily. So for example, here, I can just define now my economic dispatch problem, and I want to change the type of network. So I just define a PTDF network formulation, which is pretty common in power systems, although many researchers in optimization don't like it. But it's a language that power system engineers talk. And then we can easily go from the previous case that had copper plate to our new case that has, for example, the two constraints that make up for the line, both the line flow and the, and the, and the nodal level uh, uh, balance. And then also we can just change for the same model, for the same data, for everything the same. We just have to specify a new type of network. And in this case, we actually take from power models their standard ECPS format, and we can build all the devices that we support with all the functionality that we support using power models as networks. <laughs> and again, it was although it took a couple of days of work, but the way that is the way that is integrated is actually, I mean, I was pleasantly surprised on how well it works. I'm, I'm not going to print the AC side because right now the LaTeX doesn't support the AC printing from the power model side. And then basically. This capability of having of being able to plug plug and play different types of networks is supported by jump tensor rates. Uh, one of the best things that Jump has for us is the fact that we can actually <coughs> keep track of the total power injection and every one of the nodes separately from the model. So as you add more and more devices, you loop through the devices to include them. Basically, what you do is you start adding into this make into these dense access arrays for every time step up for each device, what is the total input power to that node? So before you go into the phase of constructing your network, you have the net balance at every node here as an affine expression. And because Jump supports creating constraints right from an affine expression that have been previously defined, we basically can keep track of this affine expression throughout the model construction and they just implement it on top of the network. So in here for the AC case, we have the complete uh, active power uh, affine expressions. And the nice property there on power systems is the fact that basically the models allows us to have the sum of the powers into a node and the reactive power ones. Um, and then the working progress right now is including service representation. Uh, there is a major piece of research that usually doesn't uh, have a lot of formality in terms of mathematics or coding, which is understanding which new services or new markets have to be created in power systems to support large amounts of renewable energy integration. How should a ramping market work? How should it be organized between like in large systems between nodal zones? So basically right now what we're looking into is a structure where we can actually have a service model specification that works on top of the devices, that works on top of the constraints and with a network to be able again, if a researcher is working only 
on understanding different services that need to be added to the system, it doesn't need to redo all of the all the device modeling or it, has, it doesn't have to redo all of the network modeling that we support from power models. The second design principle is modularity. So what we want to be able to do is basically to run many, many operation models and specifications. So we can we can we want to take to the different services, devices, and network to be able to model realistic power system operations. So a realistic power system operation is way more than your classical AC power flow or your unique commitment. There's a lot of constraints, especially for large systems that has intra-area uh, uh, different the intra-area balances that need to be kept and so on and so forth. So what we want here is to be able to be modular in this sense and be able to specify unique commitment, economic dispatch, or security constraint, economic dispatch, and unique commitment, and put them all together to be able to model, model realistic power systems. So for example, here we can see that our economic dispatch, again, now has thermal generators and renewable generators and loads. For each one of these, we know what kind of formulation they have and what kind of data is available to model. And we have for the branches and transmission the same story. We can exactly know if you have three, uh, three one transformers, DC lines, what kind of branches you have and how are you modeling them. And it's all tractable from this operational model that on the background has the jump model. And then the services that we support right there. So we basically can track down this sort of natural language description of what is in the system to a mathematical program that we can actually take, if needed, could be understand, right? In this case, the printing of course overruns because it's a larger system, but the concept here is that we can describe every device in based on its data formulation and we can track it down to the exact equations and parameters used. And the third, and the third design principle is scalability. So in this case, we're looking into developing all of this capability <laughs> because we want to run systems with over 50,000 buses, over 5,000 generators at five minute resolution, right? So we have a third layer description that is under development right now that basically what it tries to do is to put in tandem a lot of these operation models. So we can have, in the case of ERCOT, for example, they run a unit commitment, then a reliability unit commitment, then the risk economic dispatch, then security constraint economic dispatch. So if you want to model the realistic operation of a system where you have is this like serial, uh, you know, connection of different operation models that have different formulations, different assumptions, different type of models inside for generators, for loads, and so on. Or the other type of analysis that we actually want to run is for the same system, what if we have, for example, a thousand possible solar power scenarios that we want to analyze in parallel, can we just create the same operational model, provide it with the data, and run it in parallel in an HPC. So this is the, this is the piece that we're working on right now. And, um, and the other part that we're very excited to work on is we have a working uh, prototype of combining a stroke jump with power simulations where you can use the description of an operation model, as, we, as I put it together before, as one of your operation model scenarios in your OPEC site. So you can actually, so a researcher in the numerical uh, department in NREL can focus on the solution technique of a decomposition method, and it doesn't have to rewrite every operation model every time they want to test a different one, right? So we can actually provide to expansion problems the type of uh, operational models that are actually in, within the scope with the resolution and modeling that we care for. And thanks to the fact that we can actually track down the formulations that are inside, we can tell, well, what could happen if we try to do an expansion problem with an OPF, but this OPF uses a current relaxation in a way that we can always get a result and use the duals from that to actually make better decisions on the master. And um, this has been actually pretty successful. I know that in the Gator channel, I made a couple of questions that I sound quite odd, but it's because we're working <laughs> from the inside out to support a lot of things that uh, can be seen as non-traditional. So the next step right now is basically develop a structure for more devices and branches. Right now we support a limited amount of branches. Uh, power models gives us all the flow relaxations, but for example, there are monitor lines, there are different types of lines in AC that have different constraints on how much flow can, can pass over different periods of time that we want to support. We want to explore mechanisms uh, to update the affine expression. So one of the key things in power systems that you always, if you think about how do you update the problem every iteration, you might have the same formulation, but you update the time series data. So it's basically your right hand side or your parameter from your affine expression. So here, one of the questions that we have is, should we use parameter jump to define this type of problems and then just update those parameters as we deploy different scenarios or actually use MOI <coughs> modification so we don't have to rebuild the problem. 
people usually tell us, oh, how much, how expensive can it be to actually reveal the model uh, if the solving takes a large amount of time? That's true. But in a larger model, if you have to do that 100 times or 1,000 times, you actually want to make your model building as efficient as possible. So this is one use that we're exploring right now. I hope to talk with Joaquin to see how we can implement this and see the performance um, of this uh, you know, parameter jump on MOI modification. Uh, one of the experiments that we've also been doing is actually develop compiled versions of a jump model that given that a computer has IP opt or CPEX in the serve, you can actually deploy compiled versions of the self-contained operational model. So if you actually want to scale it up, we can get, get an operational model as a self-executable that reads some data and executes itself without, you know, just basically using the capacity from Julia to use, uh, the, I mean, the in-time in compiling, getting the executable and just deploying that in a cluster instead of having to start Julia every case. And, uh, we, are, we want to use this experience gain developing the structure for system simulations to actually implement the same type of structure and model for water systems and gas systems. And that's my talk. Thank you very much. much can you reuse from your current implementation here? For right. all the common constraints, for example, uh, that probably will be reused. Because we have the, all of these physical devices have sort of the same type of constraints, right? So you're going to have some devices that are going to have on and off of the range, right? You're going to have some devices that are going to be limited to time series, which actually require some extra, like how do you pass the data to a jump constraint, given that you have time series data. You have devices that have exclusivity, like can be on or can be off in either one or two direction. Or for example, a piping, a gas system can be flowing in one direction or the other. So you have systems with reserve. So a lot of the jump code is actually uh, kind of, we try to keep all of the jump code within the common constraints. So every time the jump changes, we can actually just change it there. Actually, a funny story is that we started this project exactly when you guys announced you're going to move to MOI. <laughs> and through the last year, all of my collaborators at Enrique had been saying, like, why did you decide to use this thing that is not ready? And like, and we've been go we've been growing. I in inside of the lab, we've been growing with you, <laughs> with the headings that MOI brings, and trying to see how we can implement the ideas that we have with the structure that you guys provide us. So uh, fortunately, has been really the end products have been very successful. People are happy, <laughs> but the idea that we can use basically the same. The, the only thing that will change is how do you deploy the data. Um, and maybe you will need to use some NL constraints in some cases for gas and water because those are like slightly more complex calculations. But otherwise, uh, <laughs> my hope is that we can use about 80% of the structure that is being made to actually run other networks. And use the, the last part, this one. Uh, use this last part to connect different infrastructures with themselves to actually run standard operations. So, how difficult is it to uh, uh, incorporate uh, multi phase lines into your uh, problem? Because now we have been in Los Angeles looking at more of these three phase power models, and uh, stuff. so <coughs> that's something which uh, you're looking at. Right? Yeah, actually, there's a separate project, another LDRD, <laughs> that is looking into implementing all of this, but for multi phase systems. Um, the first step into that is like we we do have a like a, the approach that we have is that we want to use multiple dispatch as much as possible, right. so that when the new device gets created or a, a researcher wants to come up with a new device, it's easier to just include it. So like it actually talks exactly what Stefan was doing in his presentation. We want to create an abstract type structure that you can create data depending on what you have in an easy way and dispatch the same functions. It seems that most of the packages in Los Alamos are based on dictionaries. Right. Which is <coughs> way more difficult to do multiple things. I mean, you can't if you don't have a stroke, right? right? So that's a thing. For example, right now, it's one of the bottlenecks in the creation of models. So as long as we're able to create a data structure of power systems tree phase, so to speak, let's say tree, power systems .jl tree phase, that is compatible with a data model that is going to be implemented in a dictionary at Los Alamos, then it's going to be an easy thing because that's what we have for power systems. If the two data models deviate too much, that might be slightly more complicated. Um, the other thing is like, again, if the same structure remains, and then we can keep 
the expressions of the affine balances now not now not per node but now node and face then it will be easy also it depends a lot on like how you guys decide to go with your software design and like that, that's basically the, the, the answer. Like, depends a lot on how you decide to wear your software design. <laughs> if it follows kind of the same guidelines, might be easy. But the dictionary to stroke conversion is being right now like a major bottleneck that we have because we have to basically loop through all of our structures, populate a semi-empty dictionary, pass it to power models, and power model returns the, the 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 information. So if we can bypass that conversion, probably things will be even faster. Any other questions? Okay, um, so <coughs> we are now going to move upstairs again for uh, a last coffee break and then into collaboration time. So uh, take a bath and then we'll Yeah, so let's thank all.